This is the My Campaign Coach Podcast, where we talk about how to win elections. Every week, we let you hear straight from the best consultants, operatives, and candidates in the game, all for one reason, to help you win. For more information about how we can help you win, visit MyCampaignCoach.com. Now, here's your host, Raj Schaefer. What's up, guys? This is Raz with My Campaign Coach, and this is the How to Run for Office podcast. Thank you guys so much for downloading it. This week, we're going to be talking about how to make a campaign video and audio studio on a tight budget. Over the last year and a half, I spent a lot of time and too much money researching this as I built out and tweaked my setup. And I'm finally really happy with what I put together, and I wanted to share that with you guys, all the information that I've collected and the best practices that I've discovered through doing things the right and wrong way in order to give you guys access to that knowledge and save you some time and money. But first, I want to give you guys a few updates. First, we just are in the process of launching the My Campaign Coach Minute. Now, we got this up on iTunes. You can find it there. We're actually also on Amazon's Alexa. So if you have one of their smart devices, the Echo or the Dot or the Tap, you can download that and subscribe to the new My Campaign Coach Minute through your flash briefing on there, which is pretty cool. So I'm excited about it. It was kind of cool getting that approved. It's a new thing, but as so many of these smart devices are getting out there in people's homes, we wanted to get on that platform as well. Just another place to make it easier for you guys to digest this content. The My Campaign Coach Minute is going to be 60 to 90 seconds, so it might be a long minute in some cases, but we're going to be breaking down some awesome tips that I've learned and that I've got from other people about campaigns and how to run a good campaign and win office. And they're broadly applicable. We're going to give you the quick uh, meme-worthy tip, and we're then going to break that down into why it's important, tell you a little bit about how to leverage that information in your campaign. And if time allows, we'll probably give a war story talking about how we've seen that tip be important in the campaigns that I've worked on, in the campaigns of podcast guests, or in the news. Second, we also launched the Elite Campaign Mastermind Group. You may have seen some of the notices on Facebook and in the news about changes in the Facebook algorithm and how they are making it harder and harder for pages to get reach. So what I'm talking about there is the organic reach where just because people are sharing or because you're posting on the page, it's actually get out there in front of people in the Facebook feed. And you know, Facebook's a for-profit company. They're publicly traded. They got to make money, and advertising is how they do that. So I don't fault them for that, but I got to find a way that on a tighter budget, I can get the message that we're trying to share out there. So the group, the Elite Campaign Mastermind group, is tied to the My Campaign Coach page. You can find it by just searching for Elite Campaign Mastermind or go to facebook.com slash groups slash MCC Mastermind. And uh, it's a closed group, but just apply and I'll, uh, I'll let you on in. All of our listeners, I'm hoping, will join up. And it's a place that we can have a better conversation than on the page about campaigns and best practices. And I want to get ideas and feedback from you guys as well as questions and an opportunity to build a tighter relationship with you. Number three on the updates is that we've launched a Patreon support page. So this takes a lot of money and time to build a podcast with my virtual assistant and the subscriptions and everything that we've got to have running in order to get this information out to you guys. It's not cheap, uh, but I want to give people the opportunity to support what we're doing. I would appreciate that. And I had a couple people reach out to me asking if there was a way they could. There wasn't, so I set one up. And Patreon is a cool way to do that. You can give a monthly pledge of from $1 on up to as much as you want to give our way. And we're shooting on trying to get a significant amount of funding in through that way over the next few months. We got our first one to sign up, JD. I want to give a shout out. He was our first guy to sign up on Patreon, and we're excited about his gift. And we're hoping that more of you guys will follow suit. If you enjoy listening to podcasts and if you want to see it keep coming, I would encourage you to think about pitching in a dollar, three dollars, five dollars, uh, whatever you think it's worth. We would love to to see that come our way and help us keep creating content. I'm working on getting more and more out there over the next year, and your support is not only going to help me financially get that out there, but it's also going to help show that I'm headed in the right direction, and I'm going to be looking very closely to the feedback that I get from our Patreon supporters as I'm trying to figure out what types of content to get in there. So I would really appreciate it. There's a couple cool freebies that we're going to be giving away and special access that we're going to be granting to our Patreon supporters. So go to patreon.com slash mycampaigncoach. That's patreon, P-A-T-R-E-O-N.com to get more information about that, what we're giving away to our Patreon supporters, and sign up to, uh, to help us keep this thing going. Lastly, one of the really cool things that happened this last week is I was looking at our download stats and I saw this huge spike. We normally get a pretty good number of daily downloads, but 
uh, I saw like a thousand or more on the on the download stats, and I actually contacted our. It was like 1,047, and I contacted our hosting company, Blueberry, and I was like, hey, I think there may be a problem. We, I'm showing a huge spike. What was the deal there? Just want to make sure it's working right. And he came back and said, nope, that's how many downloads you got. So I did some tracking, and apparently Apple on iTunes, uh, for some reason, thank God, they put us up there on one of their front pages where people could see us and get a lot of access, and we got a whole lot of new folks downloading. So I'm really excited about that, and I want to reach out to all you guys that downloaded, and hopefully you're sticking around. I hope you enjoyed the Chris Voss podcast and the Drew Ryan podcast and all the others that got downloaded. It was pretty evenly split among a lot of our episodes, and so I'm hoping a lot of you guys are sticking around and will hit the subscribe button. We love it when you do that. We love it when we get reviews and uh, we, people rate us. That always helps us get in front of more people, and between those new podcasts and the one-day spike in downloads, I'm pretty stoked. If you haven't got to listen to those, the Drew Ryan and the Chris Voss podcast, I highly recommend you go back and get those. Uh, Chris Voss is the former lead international hostage negotiator for the FBI and shared some awesome tips for negotiation that are helping me as I'm talking with donors and uh, debating politics out in the world and in the work that I do. And I think they're going to be really helpful to you as well. All right. So we're here to talk about campaign video studio on a tight budget. Now, I want to start out with a disclaimer. First of all, professionals do professional work. And when you go free and cheap, you often get what you pay for. So given that, the fact is that a lot of us don't have money to hire professionals to come in and shoot every video that we've got. If you're running a campaign, my hope is that you'll have some money for some good video, at least some good pictures and hopefully some good video at some point during the campaign. But the budget size and making sure that you're allocating a proper amount of that for those good deliverables and good collateral, uh, that's a discussion for a different day and one that I have to have a little bit more information about your specific campaign and budget and amount that you expect to raise. But for this, the purpose of this discussion, we're going to assume that you have an interest in creating more audio and video products for your campaign to get out there in front of voters and, and supporters, but you don't have enough budget to just call in a three-man video crew and hire professional editors every single time you want to get in front of your voters. And it's really cool because with the the proliferation of live video over the last several years and how easy it is to get stuff out there and in front of your supporters, it's really awesome to be able to get out and do that more and more. So it's easy to get it out there. People love it. On Facebook and social media, those types of assets versus links and stuff like that, they really rank highly as far as their shareability and their interaction and organic reach. So we want to take advantage of that and make sure that we're getting the type of assets that have a large amounts of proliferation out in front of lots of people. So what about a cheap or reasonably cost way for us to do that? Well, that's a problem that I've been dealing with on my side, just creating content for my campaign coach for most of the last couple of years, I mean, as long as I've been doing this stuff, year and a half, two years, something like that. And during that process, I have not only found some really great ways to do it, but I've also found some ways not to do it, uh, mainly because I've tried those and failed, or I thought I was succeeding, and then I found a much better way. So today, we're going to kind of talk through a lot of those in order to figure out what works. So to give you guys a little bit of perspective and context, what I wanted to do, we, we each have to understand what the purpose is for our setup and our studio in order to make it work right and pick the right options for us. Because I'm going to present several here throughout the, the episode today. So for me, I wanted to record podcasts, you know, like now. I wanted to be able to do Facebook live video. I wanted to be able to record video trainings and also just record general political videos, talking about an issue or sharing a perspective. I, those are the basic types of things that I wanted to be able to record in my studio. So I made sure I wrote that down. I got my nice big whiteboard on the wall. I put that down as I was trying to map out what I wanted to do. Second, I went and I started looking online for different blogs and tutorials about how to set up a good studio. I found two of them that really had a big impact on me, and I've shared those in the show notes and on the on the blog associated with this podcast. Uh, one was through Teachable.com, which is the platform I use for our online courses, and one was through Wistia. They do a lot of uh, a lot of tutorials and things like that, and they have a great one on a DIY office video studio. So I've got both of those in the show notes. I highly recommend you check them both out. Uh, I do have a lot of the same links that they share shared in the the blog accompanying this episode. So you'll see some good crossover, but they've got some awesome videos in there showing you how they set it up, which I don't have yet. So check those out as well. I also wanted to make sure that I had better lighting because uh, you know I got my my lighting kit 
a year or so ago, but I wasn't really happy with the lighting that I had in my videos because I was, I was, as I was recording the first few modules for the advanced candidate course that we've published, I really just wasn't happy with the video with, and really the biggest problem with it was not the background. It wasn't the, with the video quality, the resolution, but it came down to the lighting. And I had a good lighting kit that I'll tell you guys about here in a few minutes, but it came down to the, uh, that I was using a bad camera. So we'll talk about how to find the right camera and some of the options and what I found here today. A couple other things you want to keep in mind. One, you need to have a reasonably fast computer. Having a newer one is better. Uh, you need to have good Wi-Fi, especially if you're streaming live. You need to have plenty of storage space on your computer for lots of video files because you want to cut, you know, record a lot, and then you can cut things, delete things. But we want to be, have plenty of space to keep plenty. Uh, using Dropbox, Google Drive, and things like that, or an external hard drive, are great ways to do that. Now, the first thing we want to consider is where are you going to record? What's your studio going to look like? Now, for me, I have an outbuilding that used to be my woodworking shop out back of my house. I got about, it's like about 15 by 15, and I've set this up as my studio. So, a couple of things that made me shift out here. I, I previously had my office in my house. And then as my wife was was uh, not working anymore and staying home and she was pregnant and then we had our son, I was like, you know what? The number of distractions that I have in here and the number of background noises are only going to go up dramatically. Just having my dogs in there was bad enough. Then there was stuff, there's baby crying and there was stuff getting put in the sink in the other room and you were hearing all of it on the, on the audio and I just wasn't happy with that. I wanted a better quality. So I was like, you know what? I need to be able to have fewer distractions, especially as far as the audio side. I also wanted to be able to leave my lights and my kit up because one of the things that I found distracting me from and stopping me from cutting more videos was that I'd have an idea and then the barriers between me and getting something recorded and up online were that I not only had to come up with the idea and outline what I want to talk about and get the content strategy ready, but then I had to go get all of my kit out of the closet. I had to set up all my lights. I had to string all my cables. I had to adjust everything to make sure that I had all the stuff set just right. And then I could hit record. And by the time I hit recording, I'd either forgotten about what I wanted to record or my time to do so was down. It, you know, it's just like, you know, being lazy getting to the gym. You can get over it, but it makes it a whole lot easier. And we really want to set ourselves up to where we will actually use the video kit we're fixing to put together. So having some place that I could have all of my lights and stuff set up and it wouldn't be in the way of the dogs or my wife or anything like that was, was important to me. I didn't want to clutter up the house and she didn't want me to. Then you also want to think about the acoustics. So because I'm here in a concrete floored room, I have, you know, several foam panels on the wall and I have a big rug on the floor to help dampen down the acoustics and kind of eat up some of that extraneous noise. And that helps quite a bit along with having a good microphone to make sure that it has a nice warm quality to the audio. I also want to be able to control the lighting better because I was having to do most of my video recording at night so that there was no ambient light from outside because I didn't have good blackout curtains on the windows and there was just too many light sources and it was a real pain to try to rig up towels and <laughs> blackout curtains and something every time I wanted to record a video. So all that told, I knew that I needed to come out here to my shop. Now, everybody doesn't have that, but I would encourage you to think about what's a place that fits as many of those criteria as possible. If you can leave your lights up, that's awesome. It's like, where can you minimize distractions? How are the acoustics? And can you control the external and internal lighting? Those will all come into better focus as we talk through the kit and what exactly you need to do with it. Now, once you got your space figured out, the camera is the next thing I would encourage you to consider. Part of this is because it's the last thing that I considered and it really bit me in the butt and I had low video quality or what I now look back on as being low video quality for most of 2017. I didn't get my Logitech Brio camera until about August and at that point I was just blown away by the difference in quality from the EyeSight cameras I've got on my Macs and I wish to God I could go back a year and get this thing back then. So the couple cameras that I have are the Logitech Brio 4K and it's like 150 to 200 bucks depending on whether you get a refurbished one or a brand new one. I got a refurbished one to save a few bucks on Amazon. Once again, links to all this stuff are going to be in the blog that is associated with this, this podcast. So go over there and check it out. You won't have to Google it or anything else. I don't make a penny off the links, so just click them, go for them. Uh, if you want to send me money, just go send it straight to me through Patreon. So the Logitech Brio 4K is an external plug-in camera. You can plug it into all kinds of stuff, all, you know, any of your computers with the USB interface. And what really makes it different from what I saw on the iSide is not just that the, the quality is higher. I mean, the resolution is, is 4K and it's much better. 
but it's the the customization of the settings in their associated program, the app that goes with it, that makes it just a huge step forward. One, much like in Instagram or something like that, where you can tweak the settings after the fact, after the picture been taken with the lighting and all those different factors, you can do all that within the actual app so that the video you're recording has, it looks different. So I can add more or less light. I can have more or less color richness. I can do all this different stuff within the app so that when I'm recording, I get exactly the type of look that I want. And this also makes it more forgiving on the lighting side because I don't have to have the lighting set just right. I can tweak it some within the app so that I'm not having to, to sit down and get things you know set up and then have to go to tweak the lights and sit back down to look and see how it, how it all looks on the video. Because most of my recording, I'm doing solo, so I don't have somebody to say, hey, uh, you know, key grip over there, grab that light, move it six inches to the to the you know the side. So when the, when I was using the eyesight cameras, what I noticed was that small changes in the lighting, it would autocorrect the amount of light that it was letting in, its aperture. And that meant that I had less control over the actual setting of it. With the Logitech Brio, I'm able to manually adjust that looking right at the camera so that when I'm sitting there, I can tweak things and make sure I'm looking good on camera, which is a hard enough task anyway, and get things just right the way I want it. The second option, the second camera I have is a Sony a6300 and this allows you to take 4K video as well. Uh, it allows you to you know, use any of the, the standard lenses that you might have and you're also able to pipe audio in through there directly so you don't have to sync up audio later on. Now the Logitech Brio 4K, it ha records audio but I also recommend in plugging in an external mic. You can record those in line or separately depending on what you know how complicated you want to get and how how you want to set things up after the fact in post production on both of these you have the ability to to change the the field of view and the zoom so that helps give you better perspective so i can have my camera sitting several feet away but zoomed in tight on me so that i can limit my background cuz we'll talk about the background here in a minute but it sometimes it's difficult to have an entire wall or really big room set up where you can have a good background that doesn't distract or have you know, things you don't want in the shot. So the Logitech Brio and Sony a6300 both allow you to zoom in and effectively limit the, the angle of recording. And that's really, really key. It helps cut down on the amount of post-production you got to do and clipping and trimming. And it also makes sure you're able to have just the right perspective that you want for the shot. Now, before I got the a6300 and Logitech Brio, I was going to, I tried the a GoPro in order to do some nice recording that was higher quality than I would be able to have through my eyesight. And it does record a lot higher video. The audio you can pipe in through an external connector and get better audio through a lavalier mic or a shotgun mic. But the problem that I found with the GoPro was that I could not limit, I could not, uh, I could not manually change the uh, perspective, you know, the angle of viewing that it was recording. So that since that was fixed and I didn't have any kind of electronic or manual zoom, I wasn't able to have the camera, you know, six feet away. I had to move the camera if I wanted it closer. And that made it difficult to get good perspective and to keep shadows from being cast in the background and those types of things. So GoPro is not what I would recommend. I wish I, you know, I, I use it for plenty of other fun things, but it's been useless when it comes to recording video for these types of applications. One other camera that I want to mention that I haven't personally used, but I've seen a number of people using that's pretty cool is called Mevo. That's M-E-V-O. I've got a link to that as well. Uh, this is primarily made for live streaming, and it's really cool because it allows you to basically do the work of multiple cameras from one perspective. You can either have somebody that's doing that's uh, using the the app to kind of uh, really produce the event by zooming into different perspectives and clicking through. Or you can have it set to autopilot where it's going to change the, the frame depending on what it thinks is, is going to look best there. It's pretty cool. I'd encourage you to check it out. It's kind of a little bit of witchcraft, but it's, it's very much like in a live studio production series where you've got multiple cameras. You're able to click through. The producer selects whatever camera frame they think is better, whether that's close in on the face or big all the way back on the whole stage or moving around. It'll follow you. Uh, and Mevo does all that stuff automatically or you can do it manually. It was pretty cool. I've seen some folks like Trey Edwards use that effectively, and uh, he was one of our guests last year. And I'm really intrigued by it. Don't have the money for it right now, but it's a pretty cool tool that might be useful if you're doing a lot of live video. Now that we've got the camera figured out, the next question is, can people hear you and getting your mic set up right? Now, what I use is I have an ATR microphone. It's the ATR2100, I believe. 
and it is a USB microphone that I just got a few weeks ago. And the main reason was that I've been using an MXL mic that, that I use plugging through a, a, a USB interface into my computer for most of the last year or so, but I needed a mic that I could use that it plugged in through USB with just one cable, and that was easy for me to take on the road because as I'm traveling a lot more, I need a more mobile kit, and I didn't want to bring a big setup that the other mic requires. So I got this one. I got a little foam uh, ball type uh, windscreen for it to cut down on my plosives, and it's uh, it's working pretty well for me. Hopefully, you guys can hear me well, and you're enjoying it as well. I've been quite impressed. The one drawback to this in a video perspective shoot is that uh, while it can record at a distance, you know, a couple of feet away, it, the, the quality is not as rich. So if I don't want the, the actual microphone in my shot and I haven't, I don't want to mess with, you know, rigging up some kind of drop down or having a, having a, uh, a shotgun mic that can be sitting by my camera, I may want to have something else and a lavalier mic is a really good option for that. Uh, the one that I like best is made by Rode. That's R-O-D-E. It's a Rode Lav Mic. Uh, they have one specifically made for using with uh, with smartphones and stuff. That's really good. They got a lot of options, and I've just generally linked to the the Rode microphones through the blog because I think they're really really high quality. They're some of the highest quality out there for this type of application. And they have a lot of different options based on you know your price range and what exactly you want to do. From there, we got to talk about lighting. Lighting really makes all the difference in a video. If you have good lighting, if you have it well set up, it's going to look great. If you don't, it's going to suck. So I played a lot of, uh, around a lot with mine through the last year or so, and I actually ended up with a four-point lighting setup that I really like. And the, whether you got three or five or twenty, or whatever, you know, it's, it, this all kind of depends on what you have available, your space, and how much kit you've got. So what I did is I got the Limo Pro lighting kit and background kit off of Amazon. I think it was like a hundred and some bucks. It's not too expensive. I'll have all the all the numbers and the links and the, the draft budget in the blog. Uh, but I got this and it worked really, really well. It has a couple soft boxes. It has a couple reflectors and it has all the different things that I needed to get a start. Uh, I went and I got some, some natural white LED bulbs from Home Depot. And I also got a few just like clamp lights. These are you know, like 12 or 15 bucks, got buck clamp lights that you can buy. They're, they're really cheap, but they're also very adjustable and can clamp on anything. So what I do is I have uh, two soft boxes that I have set up at 45 degree angles from my face, and I have them set at a ratio of one and three. So they're basically three, uh, three parts distance away from each other. So one, if that's, you know, three feet away, the others mean nine feet away type thing. This allows for for a little bit of a dramatic shadow on my face when I'm recording and a little bit of perspective that helps kind of give some depth. I then have the hair light, which helps uh, basically disconnect me or kind of differentiate me from the background and light my head and my shoulders. Helps give that depth there. And then the fourth light is a, another one of those clamp lights. It's actually clamped to the back of my chair that is a flood on the backdrop. And this helps break up any shadows that my body casts from the two lights at the 45 degree angles from in front of me. So all of this really helps break up and make sure that the, the light, any shadows are broken up and then I have a good clean backdrop that's well lit. I am differentiated as far as distance from the backdrop and that my face is, and, and shoulders are well lit. Now you can try a lot of different stuff. This is something you'll try, you'll play with. Uh, I do recommend that when you're at Home Depot picking up those LEDs and the and the clamp lights, pick up a few dimmer switches. Uh, they're about you know eight or twelve bucks, and I've got several of them, one for each light. So I got four of those things, and that allows me to basically have a little light control setup on my desk. So I have all of them plugged in through uh, through extension cables, and then through those. So I have my four. Uh, my four light switches, the dimmer switches on my desk, so that if I need to have more control over the changes in light than the Logitech settings will allow me, then I can you know play with those and get everything just right while I'm looking at my screen and I don't have to move. It saves me a lot of time, makes things much easier. There are lots of different light kits on on Amazon. There are plenty of them that are good. Just look at the reviews. The Limo Pro is what I got, uh, but there's a lot of other options as well. If you're just doing stuff with an iPhone or an iPad or something like that, or if you're stuck using a, an iSight camera, one of the things you may be able to do is just use a little cheap selfie ring. Like these are these are some kind of kitschy things that even some folks are giving away as freebies or at events. Uh, these are selfie rings. My my mother-in-law gave me one that she got from a kit of uh, stuff of makeup from Rodan and Fields. That's like a little deal that plugs into a USB deal to charge, 
and it works really well. It's really bright, and I can put it where it uh, it has a cutout for the iPhone uh, camera, and so I'm able to have that on there. So if I'm cutting video or recording something on my iPhone, I can still have really good light, and it's bright enough that you could clamp it to a computer or something like that, and it would work well with the laptop. There are other selfie ring type things out there. This that helps give you very good coverage on your face, and uh, but but it kind of leaves the background darker. For most political applications, I think that you need a little bit more light. I tend to to like that a lot more, and, and maybe a little bit of natural light in there won't be too bad. Uh, you just want to have control over it, and so that's why I want to make sure that if I've you know, here in my shop, I've got all the windows blocked out, so that regardless of the time of day, I have complete control over the light that's coming in, and I can let more, I can let less, and I can use my the lighting kit that I've set up to make everything just perfect. Now the background, this is something else that I've I've played with. So in that Limo kit that I talked about for lighting, it also comes with a background set up with a big. Um, a big rig where you can hang sheets and stuff like that, or, or the, one of the uh, the photo paper arrays. So I tried for a long time to get a get my backdrop to hang well, and it caused me no end of frustration because these sheets they're not you know, they're, they weren't terribly high quality. It's one of the drawbacks of the Limo setup, um, and they wouldn't hang straight. When you hang something, it's going to have wrinkles or ripples in there, and that drove me nuts. I want a nice, clean, flat background, and I wanted something that wasn't going to break the bank. I assumed at that point that if I want to have a professional paper backdrop, which is better, uh, that it would cost me a lot of money. But I finally got around. I found Savage Universal, which is a company that does backdrops for photographers online. It's linked in the blog. And it did not cost much at all for me to get a very large, long roll of paper that I can hang in my shop on that same rig or on the wall. And it works great. One quick tip on that is if you're not going to be shooting for a long time, make sure you have a really, really strong pipe to hang it on or that you stand it up vertically in the edge of your shop or lay it down. Uh, the main reason is that because it's on a big cardboard tube, even though it's stronger than like, a, say, a, a toilet paper roll, it's still going to sag in the middle. And so you will get some ripples over time if you don't, uh, don't store it well. I've learned that the hard way and had to make some changes to my setup as a result. When you're trying to pick what type of background you want, uh, there are a lot of different options. So you have a stage backdrop, which might be just a normal room that you have set up to where whatever is behind you looks nice on video. That is the cheapest option, but it may not work well with you know, whatever type of backdrop you have in your house or your office, wherever you're cutting a video. You may just not have a good backdrop to be able to put one together. That's the case in my office. I have you know, a bunch of uh, bracket hanging wall or stuff on my wall, and I just couldn't make it nice for, uh, for recording on. I needed to hang something in front of it. So the paper backdrop, that allowed me to do exactly what I needed and put up the perfect backdrop. I got a flat, kind of a flat light gray. Uh, you can get about any color out there and even some printed backdrop or some custom printed ones through Savage Universal. Uh, those are more expensive uh, and I do recommend staying away from any type of bright primary colors. It's just not a good idea. It doesn't look good with people on video. Uh, but you can get some custom ones if you wanted like some kind of campaign logo or some kind of specific backdrop that looks nice. That just makes it more expensive and I didn't have a reason for that. You can also go with uh, less focus on the background through blurring it, through having some bokeh in your video, or having a green screen that lets you blur out the background and replace it. The Logitech Brio does allow you to do background replace or blur, uh, but because of the computer that I have, it's not, uh, it's not, it doesn't have a good enough graphics card to do that well. So this is where the type of computer you have does come into play. Because one of my computers, my older 2010 Mac, it does not allow me to do a background place at all. And my a little bit newer, I'm uh, my little bit newer MacBook does not allow me to do that well. It, it just blurs part of my body out. So if you have a computer that'll let you do it well, then go for it. That might be a, make a good tool. But otherwise, just get a good background up there. One last thought on that is some people will do. Facebook lives or videos on their from their phone on the campaign trail. So they might be them sitting in their car or something like that. That's cool. Don't do it while you're driving. But one of the things that I've used in the past is a good phone mount for my phone to let me be able to be back a little more, have a bit, little bit better perspective than just holding my arm out selfie style. And the iAudi car mount that I linked to in the blog is really, really good. It's what I use just for my general driving around, have my GPS up there. But it also works really well for video if you're doing some in-the-car stuff or need to stick it to a window somewhere. Now, everybody is not really good at just speaking extemporaneously off the cuff. Even me, like I've got an I've got a, an outline in front of me that I went through and wrote up this morning as I'm trying to make sure that I'm sticking on topic and not forgetting things. So 
if you're doing video, you want to make sure that you're able to maintain good eye contact with the video itself, with the video camera itself, as well as stay on topic. And it's really important that we be concise and have tight, focused language as we're talking to people about these things. Because if you look at the stats for the view length on Facebook or YouTube, it's very, very low. Most people don't listen to or watch the whole video. They'll see a little bit of it. So we want to take that into account and make sure that the content we're putting out is punchy and it's concise and it's very, very focused. So if that's the case, we got to make sure that we are coming up with some good stuff and that our video is tight. So if we're, if we're doing that, a couple things we can do. One is note cards. So we can hang those or tape those right below the, the camera aperture, and that way our eyes don't eat, deviate that much. Um, this is a low-tech, less-than-perfect way to go, but it may be your best bet. So in that kind of case, we want to make sure that the note cards are as close as possible to the actual camera lens so that our eyes are as close as they can be. Second, if we're using those, we want to keep our eyes on the card itself, not shifting back and forth between the card and the camera, because that's going to make it very clear that we weren't actually looking at the camera, and eye shift makes us look shifty, and that's not what you want in a politician and an elected official. So wherever you're keeping your eyes focused, keep them there. Don't go back and forth. The option that I love, though, is the mini teleprompter, and I've got this linked as well. I got one of these, and I fell in love with it. It is a basically it's a, a bracket and a piece of glass that allows you to set an iPad or an iPhone in the bed of it and use an iPhone app that I'll talk about in a second that will let you take you know a document that you've put up in Google Drive or in Dropbox or something and put that onto it so it'll display for you. And the camera mounts behind the glass, shoots through it, and so you're able to, when you're reading off the screen, you're actually looking directly at the camera. So you have perfect camera eye alignment and you're able to see all of your words right there on your screen and get exactly what you scripted. It's absolutely wonderful. I fell in love with it and I've used it quite a bit and recommended it for a number of candidates. Because what this allows you to do is write up exactly what you want to say. Perfect wording, everything edited, get your team on board, and you can write up a bunch of these and then record them in batches. This means that you can have three or four different videos ready to go, ready to cut, based on the the wording. You didn't have to memorize anything. You're able to just cue them up on your iPad or iPhone, hit record, and go. So the the actual app that I use is called Prompt Smart Pro, and it costs a little bit, I think maybe like 10 or 15 bucks, but it's the coolest thing since sliced bread. This not only allows you to take a document from Google Drive or something like that that you prepared there and pull it down and show it up for the teleprompter, it does the mirroring so everything is, it looks all reversed and mirrored on the actual iPad itself, but when it projects onto the glass, it looks great and you can read it. And the cool thing, it actually will listen to you and it will auto advance the words on the screen as you go through and you talk. So literally, I by myself can take a document that I've prepared in Google Drive, I can put it on my in the app, and then I can hit record and start talking, and it's going to advance. I don't have to do anything with my hands. I can do all the recording solo. It's super cool and incredibly effective. I actually had one video talking about a killing a tax uh, initiative this last fall. Got like fifteen or 16,000 views in about a week and a half. And I did that all in one take with a Teleprompt Pro app. It was super cool. I loved it, you know, highly recommend it because it lets you minimize editing after the fact because I did no editing on that video and it allows you to make sure that everything is just perfect. The other options are memorization and things like that. Uh, I can't memorize worth crap, so I, that was not an option for me. So the teleprompter or doing extemporaneous stuff and then editing out the unnecessary, yeah, the, those are the options that you've got. So that does leave that last one for just editing a lot. Uh, But the reason I look at note cards, the teleprompter, or memorization as the primaries is because editing just takes time. It takes money if you're paying someone else to do it. And if you're not good at it, if you're an amateur, then you're not going to do it well. So I like to minimize the amount of editing necessary and because that just helps the video look better in general. When it comes around to recording, there's a lot of different options for the software that you can use. Now I have my preferences, but I'm going to throw out a handful, both for recording and for editing. Now, the one I'm actually a big fan of is called OBS, Open Broadcast System. And this is something you can use for Facebook Live. It is a quasi-professional open source tool that allows you to do a lot of cool stuff from having, uh, from switching back and forth between presentations. It'll let you really set up, uh, like put your logo in the corner, 
have uh, text come across. It's it's a it's a production setup. It's not just for recording, but it does allow you to record. The one drawback I've seen is that it's sometimes difficult to to figure out. It's uh, it's not a hundred percent user friendly. You kind of got to look at some of the tutorials to get it set up right. And on some of the videos that I've recorded, the audio is not synced up 100% with the video. The audio typically is just a hair off. And it's enough that I have to do a little bit of adjustment in post-production to make sure that my lips are actually matching what I'm saying. But it's not a big deal. I figured out how to do it. And once you know how to do it, it's not a, not a problem. Um, it's, it's free instead of costing a couple hundred bucks like some of the similar paid platforms are that are a little bit easier to use. One other one is Loom. So useloom.com is the website. And Loom is, it was started as basically a video sharing application. You could record a video through a plugin in Chrome and you could send a link. It, it automatically is uploaded and so you're able to send links. So like I use that for working my virtual assistant. If I want to show her how to do something as far as training or review something with her, some some of the memes or graphics she's created, I'll just hit record and I'll just kind of talk through whatever is in front of me and I can sh- have the it, it recording the screen and then having my little camera bubble down at the corner or I can have it just record my screen or, or just record me. So I got a lot of options there and they recently did some cool stuff that allows it to be much more useful for the top recording that we're talking about. You can actually trim and edit the video within their application. Now, I haven't got to get in there and dig deep, but it, from what I watched on their, their announcement videos and the, what I read on their blog, it's pretty slick. And so I think that it's something where you can record straight from your computer using these external assets as far as a camera and lighting and stuff and be able to have it automatically uploaded. You can share that or have people look at it. You can do some minor editing in the program, and then you can download the, the, audio, the video file itself. So that's one cool way to do it. That's what I did for pretty much all of the the videos that I put up in our online courses. That allowed me to do it kind of whenever I wanted to and not have to worry about some of the upload download stuff. It's pretty easy to work with. Third is Facebook Live. Uh, this is a great tool for getting out live video content and using a uh, the repurpose.io platform. You can have this video piped straight from Facebook Live or to YouTube, etc., to make sure that you can maximize the reach and usage of that content. Uh, but it is all live, and so you're not going to have the editing capability. Zoom.us is actually a video conferencing suite that is pretty cheap or free, depending on the model you get. And it allows you to have multiple people on there. It allows you to record and, and have those saved to the web. So that's another good option if you're wanting to do some of that type of recording. Uh, but I prefer OBS and Loom to, to Zoom for this purpose. But it's another good tool that I know a lot of guys that, that use that frequently. Your iPhone or iDevice is obviously an option. The camera's getting better. I just got the iPhone 10 and they're fantastic. I haven't done a whole lot of live video with that yet, but it is an option that continues to get better. And if you're doing audio only, especially if you have an iDevice, the Boss Jock Studio app is a really cool tool for that. So you can get that and record good quality audio and have you know lead-in music and stuff like that. Uh, I know a lot of podcasters using that for their solo stuff, and that's what I'm going to be using on the road is I'm recording some of the My Campaign Coach Minute podcast. If you're recording audio only, you can also do GarageBand if you're on a Mac. I'm sure they have something on the uh, on the Windows platform, that evil dark side of the computing universe. But that's what I'm using right now to record this. Um, the interviews that I use, I typically do those via Skype, and I have the Call Recorder app on there. Now, when it comes to content creation, we know video is king and audio is great. So I have one client that I used to work with who uh, that he's running for office that he is not as good on video as he is in audio. He has a background in radio, so he's incredibly comfortable and is able to very dynamically use his voice. But... He's not used to being on video, and he's not terribly comfortable in front of the camera. And so when you, if you close your eyes and listen to him, listen to his videos, you would be like, oh, this is awesome. But then if you opened your eyes, there's this difference between how he looks and how he sounds. And he's, his face is not as dynamic. He's not as practiced with using his face to communicate, the, the, the visual side. And so the, the videos are not as great. So if you're one of those candidates or you're not as comfortable in front of the camera, don't let that stop you from getting out content consider actually using audio as a standalone. And you can do the same thing that I do with repurpose in order when I record a podcast, it kicks it over to YouTube and you can have it automatically go to Facebook as well, where it turns the audio into a video and it has a little waveform and the information about the campaign and in my case, my campaign coach on the screen in the video. 
And so you're able to repurpose that so people can still watch it. It still gets the same reach assets as Facebook or on Facebook as a video does, but you're not actually having to worry about being in front of the camera. <laughs> it also means you don't have to be as well dressed. So if you're doing audio, that's an option, but video is better. When it comes to figuring out what you're going to say and what you're going to communicate, you really do get out of content what you put into it. So, and this is a hard lesson for me. There are some weeks when I, I do more work preparing for an interview than others. And I think there's a real qualitative difference. I'm sure you guys noticed that between I'm really well prepared for a, a, an interview and when I'm not, or on one of these monologue podcasts, when I spend the time sitting down and getting, making good outline and putting down my thoughts on paper before I hit the record button. Obviously, I understand what that's like. There's some weeks that I'm really good about it, some weeks that I'm not, and I'm trying to get better and better. But you get in what you put out. Focus on being concise and just know that that's going to help you communicate in a short time frame to short attention span people. If you're running for office, you have a message counter, or you should, to know what you're talking about in a given week and what your focus is. Make sure that the videos you're putting out are consistent with that. And so even if you're bulk creating content, so if I'm putting out, or if I'm recording today, ads or video clips talking about immigration and being pro-life and pro-gun and national security and budget control and property taxes, I could record all those in one day. Just throw on some different shirts and take a drink break in the middle. If that's the case, I'm still going to drip those out in accordance with a message calendar. So bulk record when possible. That's what I do with the podcast. And then go back to make sure that you're putting stuff out that's consistent with your message calendar. And don't just put stuff out when you feel like it or about what you feel like it should be. Get some feedback. It's very helpful to get the other people on your team, your kitchen cabinet, your consultant, your wife, your spouse, gather them to look at these videos and make sure that you're doing a good job. Have them give critical feedback to make sure that you know that you're doing well so that you don't have a, a false fire event where you put something out that you later regret because the quality was not good or you didn't say something just right. There's a candidate that I know that he mentioned uh, he, a, a time in his life when he did, he, he was talking about a time in his life when he was accused of something and he mentioned the wrong age. And in his mind, that age difference, it was like two years off. He didn't think it really mattered, not a reason to recut the video. And myself and his general consultant said, no, 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 that's a big deal. Having that two year difference, it's a factual inaccuracy. So we need to recut the whole video. It was inconvenient, but it was important and it would have been a liability if he had put that out there with the wrong age on it. It wasn't a malicious mistake on his part, but we were able to catch what could have been a problem. He, his opponent could have rightly slammed him for lying about his age. And even though it wasn't truly a lie, it was a misstatement, the fact that it was inaccurate would have been used against him. So we were able to stop that from happening by just pointing out how important it was. The candidate, he didn't see it as a big deal. And uh, I totally understand why. It didn't seem like a big deal. But we were thinking about it from a different perspective and getting other perspectives on your content how you're doing on video, that's all really, really valuable. Now, I've linked to a couple different articles that give great feedback on having good video presence. But I'm going to kind of run through some of the top tips here in case you don't have the opportunity right now to go look at the blog and watch the videos. So one is make eye contact with the camera. We want to make sure that it's at eye level. We're not looking up at the camera or down at it. And having a tripod and an external camera like the Logitech Brio makes that really, really easy. As far as picking what you're wearing, go for solid colors and the shirt and things near your face should be solid, flattering colors. So pick something you look good. As a guy, I'm going to ask my wife, hey babe, what should I wear for this? What look, what colors look good on me? And I'm going to pick a polo shirt or a button-down shirt that has, night, that has colors that my wife likes and that are solid. I'm not going to wear plaid or stripes or polka dots or paisies or anything like that. I'm going to stick with a solid color button down or polo shirt, depending on how dressed up I need to make this. Don't forget to check your teeth. It's always, uh, it's, you know, it's really frustrating when you get done recording a video, go back to rewatching got that piece of spinach or blueberry hanging out in your mouth that you had for lunch. Even if you're a guy, don't hesitate to think about putting on some makeup. This really can help break down how harsh things are, take off the sheen of sweat or oil on your face. Uh, so just Ask your wife, hey, babe, might you want to dust some uh, dust some base coat or I don't even know what it's called. <laughs> I just know what she puts on my face when it's I'm a little bit too shiny when I'm going to record a video. So don't shy away from that. It might be very helpful. Just kind of see how things look and see if your wife has or, or somebody, some female you know or somebody who knows makeup might be able to give you some feedback on what to do there. Make sure that the environment you're going to be in is one where you can control the temperature and hopefully where it's comfortable. Uh, 
one thing I found over the summer was that the office that I've got, it's not very well insulated. And I found that out because I was absolutely just sweating my butt off when I was recording stuff. And for videos, for short videos, you can wipe your brow and have on a little bit of makeup and you can keep from looking too terribly sweaty for short periods at a time. But I literally had to have my air conditioning unit turned off to keep from additional background noise. And I couldn't have a fan on because I didn't want it moving my background. So I was sitting here in, in kind of a, a basically a Dutch oven or a sauna here in the office recording. For video, it was not convenient. For audio, you couldn't tell, but I was there were a couple of days that I was recording multiple podcast interviews and I got out of here. I looked like I've been sitting in a sauna for hours. So it's uh, it's going to be a lot easier for you to record good video and look good and engaging on camera if you're comfortable. So keep that in mind and make sure minimizing the, the background sounds that an air conditioning unit or fan or something can make. When you're thinking about what to do with your hands and shoulders and when you're on camera yourself. So moving your hands is a great way to convey points, but they has to be natural movements. If they're robotic or if you're doing the same two things, same like bringing your hands together, moving them apart, bringing them together, moving them apart. If you're doing that same movement over and over again, it makes you look like a robot. And that's just not attractive and nobody likes that. It makes you look very unreal. It makes you look robotic and like you're not a real person. And that's not a subliminal message that we want to convey to the voting public. We also want to make sure that as far as our body, that we keep our shoulders still. We don't want to move our shoulders because we want to limit the amount of lateral head movement that we have. Now, leaning your head forward or back a little bit, that's not going to be a problem, but it looks shifty when you're moving your shoulders, especially in your head, back and forth. If you turn your head a little bit, that can be fine as long as you don't go out of the, the range of the microphone. We also want to minimize distractions. So like I talked about with my, my young son and my wife and the dogs, I want to keep them at arm's length and out of recording distance to to where they can distract me while I'm recording. I do have one dog, Thor, my big great Dane. He's behind me now, but he just hangs out here in the office with me. And other than flapping his ears or yawning every now and then, he's pretty quiet. And we want to convey our energy all while smiling. So more than just the audio and the words that you say, what you look like and the energy that comes through in your voice is really critical to communicating the right thing, making sure that the voter or the public or whoever is watching, make sure they're hearing what you're trying to say. My dad taught me communication is not what I say, it's what you hear. So changing your voice, modulating it from really, really loud and being really excited all the way down to a very quiet whisper and drawing them in. That type of modulation and really being interesting with your voice and showing energy is fantastic on video. And I highly recommend that you try to do it. Now, as you guys are going through all this, there's a lot to digest, a lot of in the weed stuff. I hope you've enjoyed it. Uh, This has been a long time coming as far as me getting all this information together. I've got all the links in the blog that accompanies it, all the different things that I bought. Uh, If you buy the same kit, you're really looking at probably about $500 is is what I would say is your out of pocket for all the stuff that I've got now. (laughs) I've spent a lot more than that over the last year and a half because I bought stuff I didn't need or I waited too long on some things that I did. So if you go and you buy this stuff, I would say you go in the ATR 2100 mic, again, the Logitech Brio, the Mini Teleprompter, the Limo Studio Lighting Kit, uh, the, the Savage Universal Background Paper. That's going to run you about 500 bucks, maybe in change, and you get the good software, and you'll be off to the races and good to go. So it, within the blog, I'm also going to have a little bit more information about my office and studio layout, links to all the kit that I've talked about, links to the apps, and kind of a rough budget for the setup in case you want to go out and buy it. I've also got a couple other links to both Uh, blogs on how to look good on video, looking good on camera, as well as some of the blogs that I look to and I got information from as I was trying to figure out what I wanted to do in setting up my kit. Thank you guys so much for downloading it today. I just want to give you guys a reminder. Every time that y'all get to give us a rating of five stars and iTunes to give us a review to help share information with your peers about what we're doing at My Campaign Coach through the new podcast that we're going to start putting out content for that here in about a week or so and through this one. I really appreciate it. It makes all the difference when we're seeing good download numbers and we're getting a higher engagement rate. So check out the Elite Campaign Mastermind group on Facebook. Make sure you like our page and give us a review there. Give us a review on iTunes. Give us some love on social media. And if you feel like it, if you're able to, we'd love to have your support through Patreon as well. Patreon.com slash MyCampaignCoach. Thank you guys so much, and I'll talk to you all again next week. Please subscribe and rate us on iTunes to help spread the word. We'll be back with you next week with more campaign insights from My Campaign Coach.